Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Poetry is a form of literature I am still growing to appreciate as I age. The depth of the wisdom communicated through rhythmic and imaginative phrasing speaks to the depths of human art. An appreciation of poetry has eluded me for most of my life. It wasn't until reading works like Gilgamesh, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Tao Te Ching that a more poetic approach to language began to sink into my literary sensibilities. In the realm of poetic appreciation, I have failed. But must I always fail? I hope not. So my guest on this episode of Classical Ideas is Dr. Stephen Taylor. Taylor is a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University in the United Kingdom where he researches the positive after-effects of facing turmoil and trauma, which he published in his book, Out of the Darkness. But that's not why Taylor is on this show. Taylor is also a poet on top of being a senior lecturer in psychology. He is the author of the new collection of poetry, The Clear Light, Spiritual Reflections and Meditations, from the Eckhart Tolle Editions Imprints Collection via New World Library. Tolle called Taylor's work as an important contribution to the shift in consciousness which is happening on our planet at present. Taylor's books have been published in 20 languages, while his articles and essays have been published in over 50 academic journals, magazines, and newspapers. He writes blog articles for Scientific American and for Psychology Today. We had a great time chatting about the clear light, poetry, and other current events in the world, and I'd like to give many thanks to my friends at New World Library, as always, for this guest. You can find all of Taylor's work at stephenmtaylor.com, and you can find me on Twitter at classical underscore ideas. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Stephen Taylor. Dr. Steve Taylor, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. It is wonderful to have you. I'm wondering if you can spend just a moment and introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit. My name is uh, Dr. Steve Taylor, as you've already uh, pointed out. Uh, I am a my main role is a psychologist. I'm a psychologist at Leeds Beckett University. I do research on spiritual experiences and spiritual transformation in the field of what's called transpersonal psychology. But I'm also a a poet. I write spiritual poetry and I've just published my third book of spiritual poetry. I write poetry to depict my own spiritual experiences and to hopefully transmit them to other people. Wonderful. That sounds like such a fascinating uh, combination of your profession as well as like a writing passion. I absolutely love the way those two things have, you know, converged together to lead you on this cool life path. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, this, there are, yeah I, I have a sort of academic side of my personality. I like doing research mainly about spirituality, but I guess um, I have my own personal experience with spirituality too, which I express in my poetry. Wonderful. Well, we'll get into all of that here in the coming minutes. Um, I'd love to know a little bit about your career path that led you to your present day role as a senior lecturer in psychology in the UK. How did you get interested in pursuing this career path in psychology in the first place? And if you had any major turning points along the way, feel free to mention those as well. It took me a long time, actually. I didn't get involved in psychology until I was 37. I'm Mm. now 53. Uh, so for a long time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, w- I, was, a, I was a musician for quite a long time until, I, until the age of 28. I played in rock bands. I used to go busking or, you know, playing street music. And um, I wanted to be a writer. But back then I was trying to write novels and stories. I always wrote poetry, too. But um, I, do, I always had a passionate interest in spirituality from a young age. I started to have my own spiritual experiences when I was maybe 16 or 17 Mm -hmm. I'd feel a sense of connection to nature I'd feel a sense of uh, euphoria when I was in quiet surroundings for no for no apparent reason but at the time I didn't really understand those experiences so I thought I was probably a bit crazy Mm. and other people thought I was a bit crazy too (laughs) so (laughs) it took me a long time to understand myself it's only later on when I was probably in my early 20s I started to read books on mysticism and spirituality. 
But then I thought, hey, I recognize these experiences. These are the kind of experiences I've been having. Mm. So then I began to make sense of my experiences. And eventually, you know, after my career, so-called career as a musician sort of, um, you know, led, led nowhere. And uh, mm. um, eventually I, I started to think in terms of studying spirituality from a, a psychological perspective. And I found out about uh, transpersonal psychology, which I'd never even heard of before. But I found out that through transpersonal psychology, you could study psychology. Sorry, you could study spirituality mm. from an academic perspective. Mm. So I, I went back to university. I did a master's degree, a PhD, and so on. And eventually I became a researcher and lecturer. Awesome. Um, so living in the UK, I know that the the culture of busking over there is super popular. When I used to, I used to live in Surrey. Um, oh, about, yeah. about 10 years ago and one of my favorite things to do was walk through all the town centers across England and watch some of the most incredible street performers uh, and musicians like I've ever seen some of the best shows I've ever seen were actually in the street in front of like a Marks and Spencer or something yeah funny enough today I was walking through um, the town where my university is based it's just called Leeds yeah and there was there was an opera singer busking this amazing really loud and really powerful really kind of passionate opera singer in the middle of the town square with a, a backing CD. Yeah, and, and there were, I saw two other guitarists. Uh, you know, there seem to be a lot of buskers around now. I absolutely love it. Well, the, all the venues are closed, so they're taken to the streets. I guess, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. What well, you... I used to do, I used to live in Germany. I used to live in Ber uh, near Berlin. In oh, Germany. cool. I used to go on the, um, the tube trains, the subway trains, you know, playing, singing and playing the guitar and passing around a hat at the end so fantastic that's yeah, such an that, adventurous life too yeah it was a very sort of hand-to-mouth bohemian kind of lifestyle which i enjoyed it yeah well and you also mentioned that you were reading some some books that capture the experience of spirituality that you were experiencing yourself what are some of those early standout texts that linger that linger for you the first one was a it's not a very well-known book, but it was a book called The Mysticism, A Study and an Anthology by a scholar of mysticism called uh, F.C. Happold. And it's basically a, just a collection of reports of mystical experiences and also um, some short texts from, you know, from spiritual books like the Bhagavad Gita yes. or the Tao Te Ching, the Upanishads and some Christian mystical texts like the Cloud of Unknowing. So that was the first book that really hit me. I actually used to carry that book around in my pocket, in my sort of coat pocket. Ah, oh, that's I fantastic. I felt so attached to it. And and that led me on to the Upanishads. And I loved, I still love the Upanishads. I used to carry that around too in my pocket. Um, you know, the Indian Upanishads with the descriptions of Brahman. Yeah. Uh, or spirits pervading the world. I could, I could um, you know, really empathize with that because I could, in in, in my own spiritual experiences, I would become aware of a kind of energy or force which seemed to pervade the sky and which all material things seem to be manifestations of. So when I read the descriptions of Brahman in the Upanishads, you know, I recognized that that was my own experience. Mm. Wonderful. Well, so in your academic career, I know that some of your major areas of research is on like the positive after effects of facing turmoil and trauma. But that you also have taught on consciousness studies, positive psychology, psychonautics, lifespan, crime. Um, mm -hmm. How do you describe, like, the? do you have, like, phases of your career that you've moved through as a professor? Yeah, I mean, initially, I was mainly interested in what I call awakening experiences. Mm. And they are temporary spiritual experiences, a bit like, you know, the experiences I described before my own personal experiences, you know, moments when people's awareness seems to intensify and expand when people feel a sense of connection to nature or a sense of connection to other people or other living beings, or maybe they feel a sense of oneness. They feel that they are part of the universe, a part of the world. So I wanted to study those experiences to find out how common they are and why they occur, if they are related to certain triggers or certain situations or activities. And I, f I found out that a lot of those experiences were connected to psychological turmoil. I found out that about a third of awakening experiences are triggered by 
states of um, intense depression or stress or anxiety mm. or situations like bereavement or even combat, you know, quite a few experiences from soldiers in uh, in conflict zones. So, yeah, that led me on to studying the spiritual effects of psychological turmoil in more detail. And I found out that um, and that led to the next phase of my research, which was studying how intense psychological turmoil can trigger um, experiences of permanent transformation. You know, not just experiences, but actual permanent shifts of being or you know, you could I, I would call it spiritual awakening. Gotcha. Do you have any groups that you have, uh, like any like spiritual groups or religious groups that you've been drawn to as far as studying uh, consciousness experiences within certain re- religions or groups in general? Are there any that jump out at you? I feel um, a connection to a lot of different traditions, but I don't have a special affiliation to any tradition in particular. I've always felt that I'm a little bit outside traditions, even though I respect and admire a lot of them i've never kind of given myself wholly to any tradition but i admit that, but there's so many that i admire particularly um indian sort of vedanta like the upanishads and bhagavad gita um i also admire uh Taoism, um and a, le- a lesser known spiritual tradition called kashmiri shaivism mm. i really admire because kashmiri shaivism has a very kind of respectful attitude to the human body and to the material world. It sees the body and the material worlds of mani- as manifestations of spirit. You know, unlike some other traditions can be a bit kind of um, denigrating towards the physical world and the physical body. But Kashmiri Shaivism really embraces the physical and, you know, it, it suggests that there is no division between uh, the spiritual and the material. This, this is so interesting. So, like, do you advise like phd doctoral students uh who are studying spiritual awakenings within psychology for phds as well yeah yeah we yeah we've had a few students along those lines very cool i love that Mm. so okay so let's get into sort of like the topic at hand today um we came together because my friends at New World Library published a recent book of yours called The Clear Light, Spiritual Reflections and Meditations from the Eckhart Tolle Editions Imprints Collection. Uh, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about your relationship with Eckhart Tolle and New World Library in general to become part of this imprint series. Mm. Yeah, well, I have a good relationship with uh, New World Library and Eckhart Tolle. Um but yeah, I got I got to know Eckhart Tolle many years ago. Actually, about fifteen years ago now, um, when I wrote a book called The Fall. It's my first proper book, and it was coincidentally published on the same day as Eckhart's book, A New Earth. I think mm. this was back in two thousand and five. Uh, and when I read Eckhart's book, A New Earth, I thought, wow, this is you know strangely similar to my own book. Mm. It had a similar kind of um, historical approach, looking back at human history and seeing, you know, interpreting a lot of conflict and suffering of human history in terms of the ego. Yeah. So I sent Eckhart a copy of the book and to my surprise, you know, a few months later he replied and to say that he really loved the book and he wanted to help me promote it. And after that, I, I visited him in Canada and, um, you know, I, I still visit him sometimes. He comes to When he comes to England, we usually meet up. Um, yeah, so so kindly, you know, when when I heard that he was starting a his own publishing imprint, um, I'd already given him a copy of my first book of poems, which was published by another uh, publishing company, and I can't like my poems. And he said that if I if I had an, had another book of poems, he would publish it through his through his imprint. Wonderful. So that led to um, the, the Calm Center, which was published five years ago. That was my first book with Eckhart and. This book, The Clear Light, has emerged uh, five years later. Marvelous. Is there like a an overarching goal for the Tolle Editions series that you're a part of? Like what what is like the thread that ties all these texts together, if there is one? To be honest, I, I'm not really sure because the the books that they've published so far have been pretty disparate. Mm. You know, there's not much to connect them. I think basically the main theme is they're just books which Eckhart himself really loves and you know, would like to bring to a wider audience. Wonderful. I love that. Um, I've, al- I've often like uh, 
fantasized about, you know, like starting my own record label or something like that <laughs> to put out records and music that I personally really love. Um, yeah. But, you know, the music industry is just so shot that it seems like it would be a flash in the pan. Um, but So I don't. But anyway, that's what <laughs> seems like it would be so cool to have your own publishing company and imprint because you can just put out art into the world that you really love. And I just think that's really cool. Yeah, I think a lot of musicians have done that in the past, haven't they? Like the Rolling Stones have their own record label. Yeah, Led Zeppelin absolutely. Their own record label. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> the Beatles love- had their own record label and they used to sort of, uh, they uh, chose people like James Taylor. His first album was with the Beatles Record Company. Oh, cool. Nice. Um, was there like an inspired, so this new book, The Clear Light, as you mentioned, is a collection of poetry. Um, was there like an inspiring series of events that caused this collection of poems to get written by you? Like what were some, uh, what was going on in your life whenever this all came together for you? Well, it probably goes back um, about 15 years. Uh, again, back to about 2005. Now, now, I used to write poetry when I was younger, as I think I mentioned earlier. So I started writing poetry at the age of 16. I can still remember the thrill of writing my first poem mm. in my school exercise book when I was 16, you know, in my bedroom at my parents' house. And so I knew immediately that it's you know, this was something I wanted to do. It was something which, which felt so natural and and so right. I just love the the kind of the the power of creating a new form out of nothing, you know, or a new piece um, out of nothing. So I, I continued to write poems until you know my mid twenties. I wrote songs as well because I was in a band, and sometimes the lyrics became poems or the poems became lyrics to songs and and so forth. But then I stopped. I got to I got to the age of 25 or so, and it just seemed to just fade away. I think I was, you know, I was going through a difficult time, difficult time personally. You know, I was in a kind of depressive phase. I felt quite confused and uh, disorientated in my life. And maybe that just blocked my creativity. So there were probably there's probably 10 or 15 years when I didn't write any poetry. But in 2005, um, it just came back to me. I don't know why, but it just came back to me. I just picked up my pen. I had an impulse to write a poem. I picked up my pen. And it just seemed to sort of emerge almost out of nothing. It just seemed to emerge fully formed. And I thought, well, that's strange. Um, and it just felt right. It felt natural and right again. And and when I read the poem, I thought, wow, you know, this doesn't sound like me. It's, it's almost like as if it's somebody else's voice. Mm. So it was almost as if it was kind of coming through me. And after that, I felt as though I had found my voice and the impulse to write poetry returned. I think it was probably linked to the fact that my wife and I had started a family and um, it was quite stressful. We weren't getting any sleep. It was quite a kind of, um, you know, as it always is for, for new parents, it's a, it was a difficult time. <laughs> yeah. I think the stress of that time sort of sort of awoke something inside me. It was probably a case of the the power of psychological turmoil to to bring out, you know, sleeping potentials Mm. inside you so ever since then you know i I, you know i I just every now and then i feel the impulse to write a poem and sometimes they i write a few on this on a a particular theme but a lot of the a lot of the time they just seem to come and um based on reflections or experiences that i have i love that so the the subtitle of the clear light contains uh, the word spiritual, and I know you, sort of earlier you mentioned you were sort of like a, a somewhat of a spiritual outsider, like looking with fondness in on several different traditions. Do you mm. cat, do you categorize yourself in this spiritual tradition, or have has your affiliation in spirituality changed over the years? Not really. I feel as though I stand outside traditions, and I have my own experiences which do not belong to I mean I could interpret them in terms of particular traditions if I belong to those traditions mm. but um you know I have a sort of secular perspective um I wasn't brought up with a religion maybe uh, maybe I was brought up with soccer as a religion but mm-hmm. no kind of yeah. traditional religion <laughs> like a lot of people in England you know soccer is a, a religion but um no I mean that that's my own view my own view is that spirituality you know, paradoxically, has doesn't have to have anything to do with spiritual traditions. I think most people who have spiritual experiences, most people who undergo spiritual transformation, don't actually know anything about spiritual traditions. And you don't have to know anything about spiritual traditions to have these experiences. Basically, 
you know, a spiritual experience or an awakening experience, as, as I prefer to call it, it's an expansion of awareness. It's, it's as if a veil falls away and our normal limited awareness seems to expand and intensify and we gain a clearer and fuller picture of reality and we feel a sense of intense connection to the world and to other people. So, you know, if you are if you are a religious person, you would interpret that in religious terms. If you belong to a Hindu or a Buddhist spiritual tradition, you would interpret that in the terms of, you know, Buddhism or Hinduism. But if you don't have any tradition, then it's just an experience. It's just a psychological or spiritual experience. So, yeah, you, for me personally, I don't feel as though I need to belong to any particular tradition. Well, and I, I love that as well, because I uh, totally quotes from Christianity and Buddhism in the introduction to the book. And so I almost see this as like a boundary crossing piece of work. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, at the, you know, the most fundamental level, there are no traditions, really, you know, there are just different interpretations. There are different interpretations of, of the same landscape of experience. It's a bit like, um, I think I say this in one of my poems, that it's a bit like there is a, a beautiful landscape and there are different people standing at different vantage points looking at the landscape. Some people are standing on the mountain looking down at it. Some people are on the plains looking down at it, looking across it and so on. So they all have a different perspective because they're standing in different places and they all have different personalities and different outlooks as well. So that affects the interpretation. But it's fundamentally always the same landscape. So, you know, traditions like Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, the Kabbalah, uh, Christian mysticism, they're all just standing at different vantage points looking at the same landscape. And mm. so, the, you know, so there are slight differences in their teachings and practices. But, you know, there are lots of things which overlap as well because it's the same landscape of experience. Yeah. Well, you know, another thing I first noticed about this book is is that it's a book of poetry, which I totally wasn't expecting when New World Library sent me the book. And it got me thinking about how many classics are written in some kind of poetry, whether it's Gilgamesh or the Gita or the Tao Te Ching, which a, a few of which you mentioned earlier. But, um, you know, is, is yeah. there are, are there any other like uh, poetry pieces of poetry that really inspire like the structure or your style or that you like kind of see yourself within whenever you're hmm. exploring? Yeah, I definitely have some influences. But but as you say, there's there's such a strong connection between poetry and spirituality. A lot of the greatest poets in human history were very spiritually developed people. And a lot of the most spiritually developed people in history were also poets. Mm. Uh, you know, there were so many gurus who were also poets. Uh, like Sri Aurobindo wrote poetry. Sri Chimnoy wrote poetry. And you have figures like uh, like Rumi, the, um, you know, the, the Middle Eastern poet and... Uh, there's a whole tradition of Sufi poets in English. You, in England, you have people like uh, Thomas Traherne, who was a great mystic poet. And you also have figures like William Wordsworth, who was a great poet and a very spiritually developed person. And in America, you know, you have one of my favorite all time poets, Walt Whitman, mm -hmm. who, who I think was one of the most spiritually developed people ever. You know, his, his poems are just an amazing description of how the world appears from a spiritually awakened point of view. Um, so to me, a text like a book like Leaves of Grass mm. is, or you know, particularly something like Songs of My Song of Myself, is a spiritual text. It's as great as the Upanishads to me, or the Bhagavad Gita, or the Tao Te Ching, mm. because Walt Whitman was a, you know, um, he was a mystic. So he he's one of my influences, Walt Whitman, um, partly because he wrote in free verse as well. Yeah. Um, and that I write in free verse. Very few of my poems have a regular rhythm. Very few of them rhyme. And my other big influence is D.H. Lawrence, uh, the English author. He He's um, best known for his novels, but he, he wrote a lot of really fantastic spiritual poetry, particularly toward the, towards the end of his life. Wow, that's such a great list of uh, things to check out. A few things that I haven't see read before, so I'm excited for uh, for some additional homework that you've just given me. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm curious if you could do a, a reading uh, from the book. Um, it can be 
anything from from the book. There are many different wonderful passages, but I'm curious if you can read something that you that you might be particularly resonating with today for whatever reason. Okay, um, I'll read the final poem of the book, uh, which is called "The Wave," and um, I think this resonates with me because I found out uh, just a couple of days ago that my aunt has just died, and this poem it kind of it represents the journey from life to death, and it also represents the the journey of spiritual development. Um, so yeah, I think this because. I'm thinking about mortality. This poem, you know, this poem is in my mind at the moment. So this is uh, the wave. The ocean sighed with pleasure as the wind caressed and stroked her. And soon the wave was born. The wave felt his oneness with the ocean. He felt her as his source, as part of his own being, and knew that he could never exist apart from her. But soon the the wave began to watch himself. He saw his own smooth and graceful motion and was mesmerized. He saw the beautiful bubbling foam that sprayed around him and was transfixed. The wave fell in love with himself. He started to believe that he was his own master, that it was his own strength that was propelling him. He believed he was directing his own flow and could change direction if he wanted. The wave forgot the ocean and saw himself as separate, a self-sufficient, sealess wave. He felt proud of his power, exhilarated by his autonomy as he rolled faster and rose higher. But then he looked around and saw the other waves, the ones who had already peaked and crashed and were beginning to dip and to disperse and the others who were, who were already dissolving and disappearing. The wave felt afraid, realising that his form was temporary, that his speed and power would ebb away, and soon he would dissolve and disappear as well. He felt alone as he sensed the empty space around him and saw the distance between him and the other waves. He felt threatened by the ocean's vastness, now that he seemed to be separate from it. The wave resisted and rebelled. He tried to build up momentum, to collect more water, to roll more smoothly, to foam more spectacularly, to make himself so powerful that he would never dissolve away, to make his form so perfect that he could escape decay. But soon he realised that he had no choice, that he had less control than he thought, less strength than he thought. He knew he couldn't resist the flow of life and hold back time and tide. The wave stopped grasping and pushing and felt the relief of letting go and the freedom of no longer trying. After his majestic foaming rush and the glorious crescendo of his breaking, he gave himself up to his ebbing, fading flow, and to the ease of his descent. And he was filled with the joy of acceptance. The wave allowed his boundaries to soften and felt his connection to every other wave and his oneness with the whole of the ocean. He felt the vast wholeness of the ocean within his own being, then as his own being. And then the wave dipped slowed down and began to dissipate. Quietly and serenely, without fear or resistance, he gave himself to the tide and became the ocean again, knowing that he had never been anything else. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. I really like the uh, the story arc within that one. How um, you know the wave is like a selfish and arrogant, you know, brash young wave, and then realizing that he uh, that he can't do it all on his own. You know. Hmm. Yeah, I think that happens to quite a lot of people as they get older. Yeah, you know, it's um, in psychology. 
there's been a lot of research showing that old age is the happiest time of life. Mm. That the over the over 65s are the happiest. I think until about the age of 80, you know, then happiness starts to fall again. But um, I think one of the reasons for that is that people let go. You know, they become more humble. Um, they become more present and more accepting of their lives. Those are some great goals. I definitely agree. You know, and as yeah. I was as I was reading the book the other day, I found myself struggling with some uh, some emotions that I was struggling with, like a rising sense of anger as I read a few of the teachings. Um, there's a particular passage in, near the beginning called The Clear Light of the Present. And um, I read the the passage that says, Conflicts have exhausted us and grudges that have poisoned us for lifetime after lifetime can be flushed away in an instant. And, you know, I agree that healing should always be possible, but I found myself wondering about the reality of the in an instant phrase. Like, I found myself skeptical. And maybe this it's just this time that we're living mm. through right now where, like, your yeah. country and my country, you know, we, we have these in, inner divisions, these turmoils that we're going through. And I was curious if you could say a little bit more about, like, the healing and the forgiveness aspect that you that you touch on in this uh, in this early teaching in the book. Mm. It's a question of being present and letting go, because most of the the conflicts which exhaust us, as I describe in the poem, uh, most of the conflicts which cause resentment and bitterness and aggression, they're based on the past. You know, they're based on you know bitterness about the past. Uh, a lack of forgiveness in relation to past events. And, you know, if you live purely in the present, then you have to let go of those past grudges and the past bitterness. It's difficult, but if you meet somebody purely in the present, then, you know, there is there is a, a natural tendency in human beings to connect. So despite what's happened in the past, despite your differences between with somebody, if you meet them in the present and you relate to them purely in the present, then you feel this natural tendency to, to connect with them. And it's a healing tendency. It's a natural healing process. Yeah. I just flipped over to that to another teaching, meeting purely in presence that uh, and I'm looking yeah. at it right now. It's like let's meet purely in presence without any conditions or concepts, knowing that in essence we are the same and that in being we are one. And like you know, the this this tribalized time that we're dealing with, um, this notion mm. of being the same is like almost like being dismantled, it seems like, because we're like it seems like we're facing our ingrained and systemic issues of inequality in our countries. But like tribalism yeah. seems also to be being dismantled because it seems like a lot in my country in particular, we're seeing uh people who don't agree with us as being dangerous or like existential mm, almost mm. in nature. Like this is going to bring the doom of all of us, these other people, you know? Yeah. Um, and I feel like I can approach these types of conversations in the manner that you describe fairly easily. But if the people I meet start from the notion that I am an existential threat, yeah, what can I do? Well, um, you know, if you can connect with those people, a lot of the time fear is based on the unknown and mm. it's based on abstractions. It's based on abstract ideas of what people are like. Uh, so that, you know, the fear of otherness um, is based on prejudice and abstraction. So if you meet somebody in reality and you reach out and connect with them, then their fear starts to ebb away. It's a bit like, um, you know, my my grandparents, like a lot of people of that generation, were a little bit racist. Mm. And I always remember my grandmother, there used to be a Pakistani shop, a shop that was run by a Pakistani family yeah. nearby. And she would never go there, you know, out of principle because she was a bit racist. <laughs> well, very, a lot racist. Yeah. <laughs> but but finally, she decided to go in there because she was, um, you know, it was, an, it was an emergency. And she came out and said, they were actually really nice. And her prejudice started to ebb away, you know, so real connection always brings brings prejudice to an end. And but yeah, but you're right. It, it is a difficult time. But I always think back to the to Northern Ireland. You know about the troubles in yeah. Northern Ireland. And they were so entrenched. There was so, so much hostility, so much conflict, so, so many murders. 
you know, when I grew up in England in the 1980s, there was an ever present fear of the, the IRA. You know, there were a lot of bombs and a lot of terrorist attacks. But, you know, they reached an agreement, um, the Good Friday Agreement in, in the mid 1990s, I think it was. And that set up, you know, set in motion a healing process and the divisions and duality, you know, began to fade away. They still exist to a degree, but they began to fade away. Um, same thing happened in South Africa. There was, you know, reconciliation, yeah. healing. So it is possible. You know, the, the problem is when people develop a strong group identity, which is happening in, in the States now, uh, there's a real sense of otherness. And that the, the ego really feeds on group identity. It feeds on difference. Uh, it feeds really feeds on the sense that other people are different to them and they are in conflict and rivalry with other people. The otherness, you know, really gives the ego a strong sense of identity. Yeah. But but people, I think people realize after a while that it's actually poisonous. It gives them a strong identity, but it poisons, poisons them with bitterness. It, it poisons them with hatred and resentment. And eventually they realize that, you know, the only real way to find happiness is to connect, is to forget your group identity, is to transcend the abstract, unreal boundaries of groups and, you know, relate to other people with empathy and connection. So I, th I think, you know, maybe in the States you're reaching a, an extreme point of duality and otherness and conflict. But I think, you know, hopefully it will begin to fade away because people are getting poisoned by it. Yeah, well, and you know, Steve, I was reading the book the other day and I was like reading it and I was like, this is impossible. You know, your book was so positive and it was making me feel so good, but then I just kept falling <laughs> back into despair like, oh, but it's not even possible right now. So I, I was like reading the book and I was getting like, not like angry at you per se, but I was like, oh my gosh, this is just, I can't even, I can't even fathom this. But now that I'm <sighs> thinking about it, I was like, wow, it would be really that simple, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a poem in the book called, um, oh, I forgot what it's called now. It's called Making the Human Race Whole. Mm. Uh, and it's about connecting connecting with other people. You know, every time you connect with somebody, every time you form an empathic bond with somebody, you make the human race more connected. You transcend otherness and hostility and prejudice. So, you know, there there is definitely, um, you know, a, a, a trait in human beings that pulls us together. You know, we are naturally empathic and naturally altruistic. The only problem is that our natural tendency to connect is sometimes obstructed by our egos. And, you know, the ego seems, to, seems sometimes seems to take control. But I think in the end, the tendency to connect always wins. Mm. That's interesting because the tendency to connect has led to the creation of social media. And I'm curious, what is your take on social media with regards to the line, let's meet purely in the presence without any conditions mm. or concepts? Like, is this even possible? Because we do want to connect, but then we've used this connective tool to create and stoke these divisions between us that are so visible today. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, um, you know, if somebody said to me the other day, if there was a button... Uh, and this button, you can press this button and the Internet would immediately disappear. Would you press the button? And I think I, I think I would press the button mm. <laughs> to make social media and the Internet disappear. Uh, because, you know, in relation to what we were just talking about, it enables a form of connection between people uh, through Facebook or Twitter or whatever. But it's a very superficial connection. It's not a real connection. And because it's such a superficial connection, it can easily, you know, um, get distorted into hatred and bitterness and and enmity. And it does, you know, there's, there's so much vitriol on Facebook and, on, and Twitter. But in, in real life, you know, it's different because when you meet somebody in person, um, as I say, there is this natural tendency to connect, uh, you know, unless you're a psychopath. Mm. Um you know, people want to connect with each other. They want to feel empathy. We are naturally empathic creatures, but that doesn't really work on the social media because it's not a real connection. So, you know, I'm, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm slightly dubious about um, social media. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I understand. Um, another teaching that I really liked that you wrote in the book is called The Alchemy of Acceptance, number one. 
um, because it mm. reminded me so much of the structure of the Tao Te Ching, which has come up a couple of times. Like, I really loved the line that read, trauma can break you down to nothing, destroy the identity you spent your whole life building up. And I know that you've done a lot of work in psychology over the positive results of uh, post-trauma. And this seems to fit within about how we can use these moments as new starting points. Um, if people grew grow apart because they change in irreconcilable ways, that can like break us down to nothing and ignite that new starting point, yeah? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, trauma can, as the, as the poem says, break down your identity, which obviously can be a painful experience. It can be a form of literally breakdown. Um, but that's also a new beginning. You know, often when we break down, the, the, the fragments of our being fuse together again. Uh, and they usually fuse together at a higher level of order. You know, there's a natural tendency for them to inter reintegrate, mm. but at a different level, a higher level. And so we begin again and we begin again from a, a deeper and stronger starting point. You know, the, the, the structure of our being reintegrates, you know, with a, in a new pattern and we begin to see the world in a different, different way. We have more access to our potentials um, and to our innate spiritual resources. And that's, you know, that, that's what I call in my research, I call it post-traumatic transformation. Mm, I love it. Well, there, and there's one more teaching that I wanted to ask you about because I'm a runner and I'm a cyclist and I love being outside and doing active things. Mm, um, I also too. I also have a little bit of a Zazen practice that I've recently reconnected with and it's helping me to face some things that I've been distracted into avoiding. Um, I'm curious if you can tell me a little bit about the teaching at one with your body and what is your take on embodiment and why it's important more than ever to pay attention to the body during this odd 2020. Mm. Well, there, there are some, as I said before, I think there are some spiritual traditions which are quite hostile towards the body. You know, so, some traditions even say that the body is an illusion and, you know, you should take care of it because you're living in it, but you shouldn't, you know, pay much attention to it. And they, you know, they also suggest that the world is a kind of illusion uh, or even a kind of prison that we're trapped inside. But, but my, um, you know, my feeling is that that's completely wrong. My feeling has always been that the world, the physical world is sacred. It's imbued with, with spirit. And I feel the same about the body too, that the body is sacred and, and imbued with spirit. There's something holy about the body. And even on a sort of a basic physical level, the body is incredible. You know, You're, you've only got to think of the, the millions of microcosmic processes taking place in your body right now to, yeah. to keep you healthy and alive. It's just an amazing miracle of, of creation. Um, so, you know, I, I feel incredibly grateful to my body for all the things it does every moment to keep me healthy and alive. You know, there are millions of bacteria inside me doing all kinds of jobs <laughs> right, <laughs> right at the second to keep me healthy and alive. So I feel, you know, gratitude towards them. So, yeah, and, and as a result of that, um, I think it's important to to be inside your body. You know, it's so easy for us in the modern world, uh, particularly in times of stress and turmoil, you know, as in, you know, the, the pandemic and the lockdown. So, you know, it's, it, there's a tendency for us to live inside our heads and forget our bodies. You know, we become immersed in our own thought processes and we start to worry and feel anxious. But when you bring your attention down into your body, you know, you feel a sense of harmony, uh, partly, partly simply because you're getting away from your thoughts. Um, your thoughts become softer and quieter because you stop paying attention to them. And your, your being seems to expand. Your attention seems to expand throughout your whole body. And, you know, you can really get a sense that there's some kind of spiritual energy pervading your whole body. So that's what I was trying to get at in in that piece, at one with your body. I love it. Well, Steve, I've really enjoyed chatting with you about your uh, your poetry and your your work and like how your career and your writing hobbies sort of like mingle together. I'm curious about what you're what you're working on next. Do you have any goals for the next couple of years with your uh, with your work? Yeah, um, I've got two books which I'm working on at the moment, actually. Uh, one book which I've almost finished is 
a book based on my research into what I call extraordinary awakenings. So it's a collection, really a collection of stories about people who've undergone transformation in the most kind of um, difficult circumstances. So there's a chapter on prisoners who've undergone transformation, mm. another chapter on people who are addicts who've undergone a transformation, and so on. It's soldier, a chapter on soldiers as well who've undergone a transformation through combat. So that's one book I've, I've almost finished. And I've also got a sort of slightly different project. You know, um, there's, there's a, a book which has a kind of um, slightly, you know, um, it's got a, a sort of political theme. It's about the concept of what I call pathocracy, mm. which is, um, it kind of relates to the situation in the world at the moment, really. But, you know, there, there, are, there are various forms of um, political systems. You've got democracy, aristocracy, oligarchy and so on but but pathocracy is a different political system it's when governments are taken over by people with um extreme who are extremely lacking in empathy mm. who are ruthless and cruel and brutal and lacking in conscience and responsibility so um yeah i'm sort of developing a book on that theme i'm, I'm kind of interested in um slightly interested in personality disorders because they are the extreme opposite of um, spiritual awakening personality disorders like narcissism or psychopathy are states of extreme separateness so they are the polar opposite of spiritual awakening which is an ex a state of extreme connectedness so yeah i'm writing a book about the, the effects of personality disorders and how people with personality disorders tend to rise into positions of power my goodness those both sound amazing are those both going to be out on academic presses no no um the uh, the book on extraordinary awakenings i think it's going to be called extraordinary awakenings it's, that's going to be published by new world library and um i have an agent for the second book and she's just looking for she's looking for a kind of mainstream american publisher for the for that that will be awesome because those both sound super cool so really quick uh open invite to you to come back on this show and talk about one or both of those because they both sound super interesting and like books that I would enjoy reading about um, and chatting with you about for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love to come back on, yeah, and talk about those books. That'd Wonderful. Well, Steve, where can people find you if they want to follow you and know more about your work? Um, well, they can find me at Leeds Beckett University uh, if they want to come to any of my lectures at any, any point. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just joking. No, no, no fine. Well, If they want to find me on the internet, it's... Uh, um, Stephen M. Taylor.com. So that's Stephen with a V, M for Mark, Stephen Mark Taylor. Sorry, Stephen M. Taylor.com. I will also link to that in the show notes. So if anybody's listening and wants to check out Steve's work, you can find the link directly in your show notes and you can click it and it'll take you right there. Well, Dr. Steve Taylor, this has been a very wonderful chat for me, afternoon for me, evening for you. And I'm really grateful to you for spending some time with me today to talk about your new book, The Clear Light, Spiritual Reflections and Meditations from New World Library. You're welcome. Yeah, I really enjoyed chatting to you. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybick. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening.